Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part two of the illustrated mum by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter Dolphin. She was back. I smelt her as soon as we opened the front door. Marigold's sweet strong musky scent. Even as she were wandering around the flat stark naked she'd still spray herself from head to toe with perfume. There was another smell too. The strangest homely mouth-watering smell was coming from the kitchen. I ran. Marigold was standing at the table smiling all over her face kneading dough. I was so happy to see her, it didn't even strike me as weird. Oh, Marigold, I said, and I flew at her. Darling, she said, and she hugged me back, her thin arms strong, though she kept her hands stuck out from fr away from me. They were wearing half the dough like gloves. Oh, Marigold, I said again, and I lay my head on her bare shoulder. The delicate Marigold tattoo peeped out from the strap of her vest top, elegantly outlined in black. Hey, you're watering my flowers, said Marigold. Come here, baby. She took the tea towel between two doughy fingers and dabbed at my face. Don't cry, little doll. What's the matter, eh? What do you think is the matter with her, said Star, standing in the kitchen door. She was scared silly because you stayed out all night. Still, Marigold's back now, I said quickly, silently begging Star not to spoil it. Star was staring at Marigold, eyes narrowed. Where did all that cooking stuff come from, she said, pointing at the baking trays and mixing bowls and rolling pins. The whole kitchen was covered with bags of flour and icing sugar and lots of little glinting bottles, ruby red colouring, silver balls, rainbow sprinkles, chocolate dots, like some magical cake factory. I just wanted to make you girls cookies, said Marigold, kneading again. There, I think that's absolutely right now. The first lot went lumpy, so I chucked them out, and the second batch were a teeny bit burnt. They've got to be perfect. Now, here comes the best bit. Are you making chocolate chip cookies, Marigold? I asked hopefully. Better, better, better. I'm making you both angel cookies, said Marigold, rolling out the dough and sculpting it into shape. Her fingers were long and deft, working so quickly it was as if she were conjuring the angel out of thin air. Angel cookies, I said happily. Two, is that their wings? Can mine have long hair? Sure she can, said Marigold, and if chocolate chips are your favourite, your favourite, your angel can have little chocolate moles all over her. We both giggled. Marigold looked up at Star, still hovering in the doorway. How would you like your angel to look, Star? I'm not a little kid. How can you do this? You go off. You stay out all night. You don't even make it home for breakfast. You crucify Doll all day long at school, and then you bob up again without even an apology, let alone a word of explanation. And you act like you're mega mother of the year making lousy cookies. Well, count me out. You can have my cookie, and I hope it chokes you. Star stomped off to her our bedroom and slammed the door. The kitchen was suddenly silent. I knew Star was right. I knew I should go after her. I knew by the gleam in Marigold's eye and the frenzy of her fingers and the kitchen clutter that Marigold wasn't really all right at all. This was the start of one of her phases, but I couldn't spoil it. Star wants a cookie, really, I said. Of course she does, said Marigold. We'll make her a lovely angel just like yours. And seeing as she's so mad at me, we'll make my cookie a fallen angel, a little devil with horns and a tail. Do you think that'll make her laugh? You bet. You weren't really worried, were you, doll? Maybe I should have phoned. Why didn't I phone? You couldn't phone. It's been cut off because we don't pay the bill, remember? I said, nibbling a raw cookie dough. Right, so I couldn't have phoned, could I? said Marigold. Where were you? I whispered, so softly that she could pretend she hadn't heard if she wanted. Well, I popped out, and then I thought I'd meet up with some of the gang, and then there was a party. Marigold giggled. You know how I like a party. She was doing, doing the fallen angel now, her fingers skilled even though they were shaking. And then it got so late and I didn't come back to my girls. And I was very bad, said Marigold, and she pointed one finger and smacked the dough devil hard. Very, very bad. I giggled too, but Marigold picked up my uncertainty. Do you think I'm bad, doll? She asked, staring at me with her big emerald eyes. I think you're the most magic mother in the whole world, I said, dodging the question. The cookies went into the oven as real works of art, but when we took them out, they had sprawled all over the baking tray, their elaborate hairstyles matting, their long-limbed bodies coarsening, their feathery wings fat fans of dough. Oh, said Marigold, outraged, look what that stupid oven's done to my angels. But they still taste delicious, I said, biting mine quickly and burning my tongue. We'll try another batch, said Marigold. No, don't. These are fine, really. Okay, we'll start the cakes now. Cakes? Yes, I want to make all sorts of cakes. Angel cake and devil cake and cheesecake and eclairs and carrot cake and donuts and every other cake you can think of. But you like cakes, don't you? Yes, I love cakes. It's just, we'll make cakes, said Marigold. And she got a new mixing bowl and started. 
I helped her for a while and then took the bowl into the bedroom. Star was sitting on the end of her bed doing homework. Do you want to look out the bowl? I've had heaps already, I said, offering it. I thought she'd bake cookies. This is cake. The cookies went a bit funny. <laughs> surprise, surprise. She spent a fortune on that kitchen stuff. Yes, I know. She shouldn't have, but it was for us. You're really a fully paid up member of the Marigold fan club, aren't you? Star said spitefully. I blinked at her in surprise. Until recently, it always it had always been Marigold and Star. And then me, trotting along behind, trying to keep up. They were like two lovebirds, bright and beautiful, billing and coo cooing, while I was a boring old budgie in a perch by myself. I don't suppose she's thought to buy any normal food, said Star, running her finger around and round the bowl. She'd been biting her nails so badly they were just little slivers surrounded by raw pink flesh. Who wants normal food? This is much more fun. Hey, remember that time last summer when it was so hot and Marigold told us to open the fridge and there it was, simply stuffed with ice cream. Wasn't it wonderful? We ate Cornettos and Mars and Soleros and Magnums, one after another after another. And then, when they all started to melt, Star mixed them all up in a washing up bowl and said it was ice cream soup. We lived on stale bread and carrots all the rest of that week because she'd spent all the gyro, said Star. Yes, but it didn't matter because we'd had the ice cream and that was so lovely. And anyway, you made it a joke with the bread, remember? We broke each slice into little bits and played the duck game. And Marigold carved the carrots too. Remember the totem pole? That was brilliant. And the rude one. And she was so hyped up and crazy, she carved her thumb too and wouldn't go to casualty like any normal person, though I suppose they would easily have committed her. And it got all infected and she got really ill, remember? Remember? Star hissed. I put my hands over my ears, but her voice wriggled through my fingers into my head. Shut up, Star. We never ever used words like crazy, even when Marigold was at her worst. Maybe we should have told at the school today, Star said. What? She's starting to get really manic. You know she is, totally out of it. I don't know what she's going to do next, neither does she. She might clear off again tonight and not come back for a fortnight. No, she won't. She's okay now. She's being lovely. Well, make the most of it. You know what she'll get like later on. She can't help it, Star. Star had impressed this upon me over and over again. It was like a holy text. You never questioned it. Marigold was sometimes a little bit mad, only you never ever used such a blunt term. But we must never let anyone else find out, and we must always remember that Marigold couldn't help it. Her brain was just wired a different way from other people's. I imagined the ordinary brain, grey and wiggly and dull, and then I thought of Marigold's brain. I pictured it bright pink and purple, glowing inside her head. I could almost see the wires sparking so that the silver stars exploded behind her eyes. Of course she can help it, Star said. She could go into hospital and get treatment. You're the one that's mad, I said furiously. You know what it's like in there. It's a torture chamber. You know they put live electric currents through your head and poison you with chemicals so that you're sick and you shake and you can't even remember your own name. Marigold had told us all about it. She still shook at the memory. She was just exaggerating all that stuff. No, she wasn't. Look, I can remember what she was like then. And you can remember it even better than me because you were older. She was sick. She did shake. She didn't play any games with us or make up stuff or invent things. She didn't even look right. She just wore old jeans and a t-shirt all the time. Like any other old mother. That's what I want her to act like. Any old mother, said Star. She pushed the cake bowl away. I'm fed up eating this muck. I'm going out to McDonald's. You haven't got any money. Half my school hang out down, down there. I bet one of the boys will buy me a Coke and some French fries. It was a pretty safe bet. All the boys thought Star was special. Even though she was only in year eight. She had a lot of year nine and ten boys keen on her. I thought about McDonald's and my mouth watered. Can I come too? At one time, Star took me everywhere with her. She didn't question it. It was just part of her routine. But now I had to beg and plead, and often she said no. She said no now. Why don't you want me any more? It's not that I don't want you, doll. I just don't need you to be tagging around after me all the time. No one else has their kid sister hanging around. I wouldn't get in the way. I wouldn't even speak to your friends. No, doll, Star said. You should try to find your own friends. So Star went out and I stayed in with Marigold and ate raw cake and unrisen cake and burnt cake until I felt sick. There, it's been a lovely treat, hasn't it? Marigold said, anx said anxiously. Absolutely super duper, I said. I can make some more. There's still heaps of stuff. No, I I'm really, really full. I couldn't eat another thing, I said, wiping crumbs from my greasy lips. My tummy bulged over the top of my tight knickers. I was quite a skinny girl and small for ten, but it said six to eight years on a label and the elastic made red ridges on my skin. It looked like I was wearing a transparent pair of pants for ages after I'd taken them off. 
I've saved a saved a slice of each cake for Star, in case she changes her mind, said Marigold. I thought she'd love a cake treat. Don't worry, I said quickly. She's just being a bit moody. She takes after me, said Marigold. I tried to smile. Cheer up, little doll, said Marigold. Have some more. No, shut up, Marigold. She hadn't even eaten any cake herself, but she drunk several small tumblers of vodka. She poured herself another. She saw my face. It's okay, I promise. Just one little weenie drink, that's all, to cheer me up. Only maybe we won't tell Star when she comes back, she said, holding the bottle back in the cupboard and under the kitchen sink. The tap was still dripping. Stop dripping, said Marigold. She tried to turn it off more tightly and hurt her hand. Ouch! Oh, you poor thing. Don't try any more. It won't stop. Star says it needs a new washer. I cradled her sore hand in the grubby kitchen towel. That's nice, sweetie. Marigold suddenly chuckled. Look! She clenched her fist, turning her finger and thumb into her mouth. It's a little baby. Shh, little baby. She made the mouth open and wail, and then rocked the towel baby. It wants something to suck. I put my finger in the mouth, and it smiled convincingly and made little gurgly sounds. You're such fun to play with, Marigold. Star doesn't play with you that much now, does she? I sighed. Not really. She's got her own friends. She says I should get some friends too. Maybe she's right, said Marigold. Would you like to have some friends round to play, doll? They could eat up some of the cake. No, no, I don't want anyone round. Haven't you got a special friend at the moment? Well, I've got lots of friends, I lied, but no one special. I'd never been very good at making friends. I had a special friend way back in year one at Keystone Primary, a little girl called Diana, who had bunches tied with pink bobbles and a Minnie Mouse doll. We sat together and shared wax crayons and plastic scissors, and we played skipping in the playground together, and we visited the scary, smelly toilets together too, waiting outside the door for each other. I get an ache in the chest when I remember Diana and her soft bubblegum smell and her pink flowery knickers and the way her feet stuck out sideways in her red sandals, just like her own Minnie Mouse. But then we moved. We were always moving in those days, sometimes several times a year, and I never found another Diana. All the children had made their friends when I got to each new school, and I was always the odd one out. Star could arrive in a class and have a whole bunch of kids hanging on her every word by morning break, but she was different. She was born with the knack. We hadn't moved for ages now because the housing trust found the three of us this flat. We thought at first they were letting us have the whole house because it wasn't really that big. But Mrs Luft lurked below in the basement flat and Mr Rowling lived up above us in a bedsit until he died. We'd never had such a good home but it meant I was stuck in the worst school I'd ever been at where they nearly all hated me. Who would you like to have as your special friend? Marigold persisted. I thought it over carefully. I couldn't stand some of the girls, especially Kaylee and Yvonne. And then there were a lot of girls I didn't even think about much, but I did think about Tasha sometimes. She looked a little like Star, only not quite as pretty, of course, but her hair was blonde and even longer, way down past her waist. I stared at Tasha's hair when the sun shone through the window and made it gleam like a white waterfall. My hands got sweaty. I wanted to reach out and stroke her hair so much. I'd like to be friends with Tasha, I said. OK, fine. You can be Tasha's friend, said Marigold, as if it was as simple as that. No, I can't. Tasha's got heaps of friends already, and she doesn't even like me, I said, sighing. How could anyone not like my little doll, said Marigold, and she pulled me on her lap and rocked me as if I was a big towel baby. I cuddled up, careful not to lean on the new cross tattoo, which still looked very red and sore. I fingered the blue curve on her bicep, my tattoo. It was a beautiful turquoise dolphin, arching its back as it skimmed a wave. Make her swim, I begged. Marigold flexed her muscles, and the little dolphin swam up and down up and down. I'll make you swim too, my little dolphin, said Marigold, and she rocked me up and down, up and down. I closed my eyes and imagined cold sea and rainbow spray and dazzling sun as I surfed the waves. Star came back when we were still cuddled up together. She looked a little wistful. Come and join in the cuddle, even though you look too gorgeously grown up to be true, star of my heart, said Marigold. You've been drinking, Star said coldly, though Marigold's voice wasn't really slurred. Dole, you should go to bed. Marigold giggled. It's like you're the mummy, Star. Should I go to bed too? Star ignored her and sloped off to our bedroom. I followed her. She was sorting through her school books. Are you doing more homework? You're already top of your class, aren't you? Yeah, and I'm going to stay top and pass all my exams and clear off the university as soon as possible. I can't wait to get out of this dump. This isn't a dump. It's a good flat. It's a posh road. It's the best we've had. You know that. It's the best we're ever going to get with her. Oh, Star, don't. Hey, did you get French fries? Yep, and ice cream. Not the sort in the plastic cup. With butterscotch sauce, I said enviously. 
Yes, it was yummy, said Star. She looked at me. Look, I'll siphon off some of the money when she gets her next gyro, and I'll take you to McDonald's, okay? Oh, Star, you are kind. No, I'm not. Look, it's nothing you get excited about. It's what any other kid takes for granted. You're so weird, doll. You just accept all this stuff. It's not like you mind. Star never used to mind either. She used to love Marigold, love me, love our life together. She thought everyone else was grey and boring then. We three were the colourful ones, like the glowing pictures inked all over Marigold. I wish you were younger again, Star, I said. You're changing. Yes, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. Grow up. You will too. She's the only one who won't do anything about growing up. Star jerked her head in the direction of the kitchen. Marigold was playing an old Emerald City tape too loudly while she clattered kitchen pans, making yet more cakes. I hate her, Star whispered. It was like she'd spat the words. No, you don't, I said quickly. Yes, I do. You love her. She's a lousy, lousy, useless mother. No, she's not. She loves us and she's such fun. She makes up lovely games. And look at her now. She's sorry about last night, so she's making us all those cakes. Which we don't want. We can't. Why can't she make one cake like an, uh, anyone normal? Why does she go crazy all the time? <laughs> Easy, because she is crazy. Stop it, Star. She doesn't love us. If she did, she'd try to get better. She doesn't give a damn about either of us. Star was wrong. I came out of school the next day and there was Marigold waiting for me. She was standing near the other mothers, but she stuck right out. Some of the kids in the playground were pointing at her. Even Owly Morris blinked through the bottle glasses and st stood transfixed. For a moment, it was as if I'd borrowed his thick specs and was seeing Marigold clearly for the first time. I saw a red-haired woman in a halter top and shorts, her white skin vividly tattooed, designs on her arms, her shoulders, her thighs, one ankle, even her foot. I knew several of the fathers had tattoos. One of the mothers had a tiny butterfly on her shoulder blade, but no one had tattoos like Marigold. She was beautiful. She was bizarre. She didn't seem to notice that none of the others, the other mothers, were talking to her. She jumped up and down, waving both hands when she saw me. Doll! Dolly! Hi! Yoo-hoo! Now they weren't just staring at Marigold, they were staring at me too. I felt as if I were on fire. I tried to smile at Marigold as I walked towards her. My lips got stuck on my teeth. I felt like I was wading through treacle. Doll, quick! Marigold shouted. I got quicker because she was making such a noise. Which one's Tasha? Marigold asked. I felt sick. No, please! I glanced at Tasha as she crossed the playground, tossing her beautiful hair. I saw her mother, elegant and ordinary in a t-shirt and flowery skirt, her own blonde hair tied up in a top knot. I can't see her. Uh, maybe she's gone, I gabbled, but Marigold had seen my, ch my glance. Isn't that her? The one with the hair? Hi, Tasha. Tasha, come over here. Marigold, shh, don't, I said in agony. It's okay, doll, said Marigold. It wasn't okay. Tasha st stood still, staring. Tasha's, mo Tasha's mother was frowning. She hurried to Tasha, put her arm around her protectively. Hey, wait, Marigold shouted, rushing over to them. I had to follow her. What do you want? said Tasha's mother. Her alarm and hostility were so obvious that Marigold couldn't ignore it. It's okay, no worries, said Marigold. I just thought I'd introduce myself. I'm Dolphin's mother. She and Tasha are, are friends. No, we're not, said Tasha. We're not, I hissed to Marigold. Kids, said Marigold, laughing. Anyway, we've got a special tea, lots of cakes, all sorts, and we'd like Tasha to come round and play. Wouldn't we, doll? She doesn't want to, I mumbled. Of course she does, said Marigold. What's your favourite cake, Tasha? I'll make you anything you fancy. It's very kind of you, but I'm afraid Tasha can't possibly come to tea tonight. She has her ballet class, said Tasha's mother. Come along, Tasha. Tomorrow, then. How about tomorrow, said Marigold. No, thank you, said Tasha's mother, not even bothering to find another excuse. She hurried Tasha away, as if they'd just witnessed an appalling accident. Marigold stared after them, biting on the back of her hand. It's all right, I said quickly. I don't like her any more. OK. Who else should we ask, said Marigold. No one. Let's go home and eat lots of lovely cake. Just us, I said, putting my hand in Marigold's. We walked away, hand in hand. Half the school was still staring. I blinked my eyes, wishing them greener and greener, real witch's eyes, so that I could cast spells with just one flash of my glittering green orbs. Flash! Tasha and her mother lost all their hair, and they ran home hiding their pink bald heads. Flash! Kaylee and Yvonne wet their knickers in front of everyone and waddled away, dripping. Flash! Ronnie Chirley tripped over and cried like a baby. Boo-hoo! And he had to wear a dinky little baby suit, a pink one with frills. Flash! But when I looked at Owly Morris, his own glasses flashed back at me. Daisy Chain 
Marigold wanted us to go to meet Star, but I talked her out of it. I knew Star would die if all her new high school friends saw Marigold, especially in her wound up state. No, don't let's hang around Star's school. She's maybe got netball practice today anyway. Let's just go home. I don't want to go home. Boring. Let's have some fun, said Marigold. She put her arm around me, her beautiful bright hair brushing my cheek. Let's go shopping, eh? Star's been niggle naggling me about your clothes, telling me you need t-shirts and jeans and trainers. No, I don't. I don't like those sort of clothes. You know I don't, I said, swishing my dusty black velvet skirt and pointing my toes in the 1950s glittery dancing sandals. Then let's buy you new clothes you really like. How about your very first pair of high heels, Marigold suggested. The idea of owning real high heels dazzled in my head like a firework, but then a common sense doused it. I knew I wouldn't be allowed to wear high heels to school. Miss Hill had made enough fuss about my dancing shoes. They're not really suitable for school wear. Too flimsy. Can't you wear ordinary sandals? I'd looked her straight in the eye. I'm afraid we can't afford new shoes for me just at the moment, Miss Hill, I said. We had to buy these ones second hand. I wasn't really lying. The dancing shoes were second hand, but they'd cost a tenner because they were genuine fifties and in beautiful condition. Yes, high heels. I'll have some new shoes too. What star size? We'll all have, all have some new shoes, Marigold said happily. Marigold, we haven't any money. Not till the next gyro. Ha ha ha, said Marigold, and she whipped a shiny plastic card out of the pocket of her shorts. But I thought, Star said you couldn't use your credit card anymore. I got another one, didn't I? said Marigold, kissing the plastic edge of the card. She tucked it back in her pocket before I could see the name on it. Let's go shopping. Dolly, please cheer up. I want to make you happy. I divvered helplessly. I wanted to go shopping. I knew I only had to mention something casually and Marigold would buy it for me when she was in this mood. It wouldn't just be high heels, it would be strappy shoes too. Patent party shoes, ballet shoes, leather boots. Then we got onto clothes and I'd end up with a magic wardrobe. Maybe if I wore designer t-shirts and the right jeans, then Tasha would suddenly want to be friends after all. But I knew Marigold had no money in the bank to pay a credit card bill. If it was her credit card, she sort of borrowed them from people once or twice before. Star said she could end up in prison. Then what would happen to us? I don't want to go shopping. Shopping's boring. Let's, let's... I tried desperately to think of something we could do that wouldn't cost any money. Uh, let's go for a walk along Beach Brook. The brook? Yes, you used to take us down by the river when we were little. Which river? I don't know. I, I can't remember the place, but we used to feed the ducks. You and me and Star. Remember? Marigold didn't always remember things, but now her face lit up. Yes, yes, we did go, didn't we? Before you went to school. Fancy you remembering. You were still at the buggy stage. Okay, okay, we'll go and feed the ducks. Right, we need bread. What about some of the cakes that didn't turn out so good? Brilliant. We'll give the ducks a party they'll remember. Marigold hugged me. Hey, those little shoulders are still tense. What's up, Dolly? I'm fine. Are you really... You really want to feed the ducks? Yes. Then that's what we'll do, Doll. I know sometimes, well, I act a bit wild and screw up. But would you say I'm really a bad mother? No, of course not. You're a lovely mother. Star said, forget Star. Come on, let's get that cake. We rushed home, got great carrier bags of cake, and then walked all the way to Beach Brook. Marigold's high heels started killing her, so she kicked them off and stuffed them in one of the bags. She walked barefoot, her long, delicate feet padding lightly over the pavement. She had a yellow and white daisy chain tattooed around her left ankle, with trailing fronds winding down her foot and ending with one more perfect pink-tipped daisy on her big toe. Daisies are powerfully symbolic. A chain is meant to protect you from bad luck. Marigold's daisy chain wasn't always effective, but it would have been mean to point this out. Beach Brook wasn't quite as I'd hoped. I'd heard Kaylee and Yvonne talking about having a picnic there, and they made it sound like the most beautiful place in the world. But the brook seemed to have dried to a trickle, and the remaining water was covered with green scum and foamy where it lapped the bank. No ducks, I said, sighing. We'll find some, said Marigold, and then she swore violently because she'd stepped in a nettle patch. I need a dock leaf to take away the sting, she said, but we couldn't find any dock leaves anywhere. No ducks, no docks, dear oh dear, said Marigold, rubbing the sole of her foot. I'm going to walk up the bank a bit, in the grass. She held out her hand and skipped along beside her, the carrier bag of cakes banging against my leg. Marigold nibbled absent-mindedly from out of her own carrier bag, and then she started leaving a little trail of crumbs behind her. What's that story where the children get lost in a wood and leave a trail of crumbs, she said. It was in some fairy tale book. I had it when I was your age. I didn't really have any books. Maybe I pinched it from school. I don't like fairy stories. The good things happen to the beautiful people, and the ugly ones are always the baddies, I said. So? You shouldn't worry. You're beautiful, said Marigold. 
If this was a fairy story, your tongue would go black for telling fibs, I said, but I squeezed her hand. Handy Pandy. The children had funny names. I didn't like fairy stories either. It was the pictures I liked. Princesses and mermaids and fairies with long curling hair and swirly dresses. Hey, what a great idea for a custom tattoo. Did you go and do some flash work for Steve today? No, boring. But you promised him. I'll go tomorrow and I can work on a fairy tale design. A whole back. Great on a woman with flowery swirls and embellishments. I sighed. We both knew the only people who wanted custom work at the Rainbow Tattoo Studio were big brawny bikers with a hankering for a skeleton death figure on a Harley Davidson with strictly no flowery swirls. I inked the four Teletubbies on my arm in reading today, I said. They're easy to do because they're round and blobby. I had red, yellow and green felt tips, but not purple. So I asked Owley Morris for a loan of his. He's got this giant set of Karen Dash. Howley? No, Owley, because he wears really thick specs. Though he does go howly too sometimes, he gets teased an awful lot. Poor little guy. Do you get teased too, doll? No, I don't wear specs, do I? I said hurriedly. I had all four Teletubbies, just right, but then Miss Hill saw and made me go and wash my arms. I can't stick, Miss Hill. I flashed my witch eyes and twitched my black skirt and inflated Miss Hill into a gigantic grey Teletubby with a corkscrew aerial sticking out of her head. There was a wicked witch in this story and she captured the children, said Marigold. I know, I remember. I remember it now. Star read it to me when I was little. It was scary, I said. Yeah, that witch was seriously scary. But I liked the picture of her, with her big hooky nose and her wild hair and her long gnarled fingers. The witch wasn't the really scary bit. It was the mother and father at the beginning. They took Hansel and Gretel, not Handy and Pandy. They deliberately led them into the wood and got them lost on purpose. They ran off and left them there. And yet at the end, it was supposed to be a happy end. Hansel and Gretel got away from the wicked witch and got all the way back home to their mum and dad and it was like wow we're together again one big happily family i'd never ever leave you and star doll said marigold i know i did stay out and i have done stuff that's scary but i wouldn't ever try to lose you i know it's just a stupid fairy story tell you what think what the witch lived in wasn't it a little cottage made out of gingerbread yes that was the roof and there were sugar candy whirly bits and cake cake get it Blow, looking for boring old ducks. Let's make our own fairy tale gingerbread cottage, right? Right, right, right. Marigold tipped all the cake out onto the grass and started sorting it into shapes. We need a knife, she said, and something to stick it all together. Your wish is my command, oh great gingerbread genie, I said, sliding my school bag off my shoulder. My ruler made a reasonable knife, even if it was a little blunt, and I had a prick glue stick to gum everything together. I sat cross-legged on the grass watching Marigold's long white fingers whisking a cake cottage into shape. I nibbled every now and then. Don't eat my roof, said Marigold, giving me a nudge with her toe. Look, pick some buttercups and daisies. We could link them together and they'd be great curtains. I sprang up and searched. Come on, doll. I've built almost an entire house while you've been looking for those curtains, Marigold called. I can't find any, I said. Will these do instead? I thrust a few bedraggled dandelions at her. You're not supposed to pick dandelions. They say you'll wet the bed if you do, said Marigold, laughing. And then she saw my face. Oh, doll, I'm teasing. You haven't wet the bed for ages. Shh, I said, looking around, terrified in case anyone from school might be around. It's okay. Marigold carefully fashioned a twirly sponge chimney with her sharp fingernails. I was in one foster home where the mother used to put the sheets over my head if I wet them. These sopping, smelly sheets all in my face, on my hair, and all the other kids laughed. That's so mean. She was a bitch, said Marigold, and her fingernail lost control and sliced the chimney in half. She swore and sighed. Whoops, and that's the last one of the pink sponge. Chimney repair urgently required. Pass us the prick, Dolly. I kept quiet until the chimney was mended and stuck into place on the sloping yellow roof. Were you very unhappy when you were little, Marigold? I asked. Some of the time. It must have been horrible not having your mother, I said, snuggling up to her. I had a mother. She just didn't want me. I didn't care enough. I didn't care, though. No, no, what I really did want. Marigold looked at me, her green eyes very bright. A sister. I was desperate for a sister. That's why I'm so glad you and Star have each other. And we've got you, too. You're like our big sister, I said. Oh, Marigold, you've been... You've made such a lovely cottage. What about clover leaves for the curtains? They'll look quite green. Uh, green velvet, ultra stylish, said Marigold, making arches over the windows with pieces of jam tart. Stick the leafy little leafy bits at the edge of the white icing. I managed to find a clover patch and pulled up a whole clump. I squatted down and started gently tearing off each separate leaf. I wonder who will live in the cottage. A rabbit, I said. 
Rabbits would be too big and bumbly. No, two teeny tiny dormice are peeping out at us right this minute. Noses twitch, twit, twitching, looking at their dream house. If we keep very quiet. Hey, look, look. Doll, that's not quiet. You'll scare them all away. But look. I held out a clover stalk. It's a four-leaf clover. Wow, said Marigold. She looked at it carefully. One of the leaves looked as if it might just have tor been torn in two, but Marigold held it up proudly. A genuine four-leaf clover, she said. I can feel the luck throbbing through its sap. Lucky, lucky, lucky doll. She went to give it back to me. No, lucky, lucky, lucky Marigold, I said, pushing her hand away. It's yours, and you can't refuse it, or it'll muck up the luck. Oh, well, we can't muck up the luck, said Marigold, and we both giggled. Marigold twiddled the lucky clover in front of her face and then carefully wrapped it in her tissue and put it in her shorts pocket. I should be so lucky, 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 she sang. We stuck the clover curtains into the cottage and then sat in front of it, still and silent, waiting for dormice. We sat there a long time. Several flies and beetles showed an interest and a butterfly momentarily perched on the twisty chimney. I think the dormice are shy, said Marigold. They're itching to come and move in, but they can't pluck up the courage to do it while we're watching. So, shall we walk on and leave them to it? Right, but what if rabbits come too, or something bigger, a stoat or a fox or something? They'll just knock it flying, won't they? We'll put a hex around it, said Marigold. Stones. We gathered lots of little stones and arranged them in a ring around the cake cottage, leaving just a little mouse-sized gap in front of the door. Perfect, I said. Perfectissimo, said Marigold. We walked off hand in hand. After ten or twelve paces, Marigold looked over her shoulder. I saw them. The dormice, they just whisked inside. Little paws all scrabbly with excitement, Marigold said, nudging me. Really? Really, said Marigold firmly. We walked on, swinging Marigold's shoes in the empty cake bag. After a while, the brook got a bit wider, and when we rounded a bend, it got wider still, and the wild vegetation was tamed into parkland. Ducks, said Marigold, nudging me. They look very fat, overweight ducks, like they need to go on a diet. They don't need cakes, I said. And our little dormice needed their home, said Marigold. Are they sisters? Sure, Dora and Daphne. Dora's the eldest. Marigold glanced at me. But Daphne's the prettiest. Her eyes are extra big and beady and her ears are particularly exquisite. Very soft and downy on the outside and the most beautiful, delicate, shell pink inside. Daphne sounds lovely. Can she be the cleverest too, even though she's the youngest? You bet. She's the cleverest in the whole class at mouse school. She's very artistic too. She can nibble at a hazelnut, chew, chew, chew with her sharp teeth and sculpt it into a little statue. She's famous for her wooden cats. She makes them with a roly-poly round base, so they tip over with one flick of a paw or a tail. All the little mouse babies love to play tip the cat. Marigold went on and on, talking faster and faster, making it all so real, I could see the mice scampering in front of me. She could be so magic at making things up, much better than Star. Star would rarely play pretend games nowadays. She said she couldn't do it properly anymore. She'd try to pretend, but she'd just feel a fool. She couldn't believe it anymore. I was glad this new mouse game was just for Marigold and me. I realised how rarely we'd been on our own together. It felt wonderful. Marigold wasn't sad or scary at all. She was the best fun ever. Star was so critical nowadays. She made Marigold nervous and twitchy. Marigold was just fine with me. I love you, Marigold, I said, putting my arm around her slim waist. I love you too, Dolly Dolphin, she said, and she hugged me close. I could feel all the delicate bones of her ribcage through her smooth skin. I carefully patted her long, thin arm with the new tattoo etched into her sharply pointed elbow. She seemed too lightly linked together, almost as fragile as the daisy chain around her ankle, though that wasn't real. It was dyed into her skin forever. I liked the idea of it lasting. We walked on until the brook became a park stream, and we were picking our way through formal gardens. We were miles away from home. Marigold was still engrossed in tell telling her mouse saga. I didn't want to spoil things by reminding her of the time. Marigold always lived in the moment. She wasn't thinking about Star. She would have wondered why I hadn't met her after school. She'd have hung around a while and then gone home. She'd be there now, wondering what had happened to Marigold and me, waiting and worrying. I knew how awful that was. I tried hard to think about Dora and Daphne, laughing as Marigold became more outrageous, acting, being a mouse herself, her nose twitching, teeth tucked under her, over her lip, her hands curled into mouse paws. But she thought of Star. The thought of Star wouldn't go away. Star will be wondering where we are, I said at last. Marigold looked surprised. I thought she had netball practice. Yes, but it's nearly half past five now. It's not. And it'll take us hours to walk home. We'll get a bus, said Marigold, feeling in her pocket for change. She brought out the tissue containing the four-leaf clover and smiled. 
The bus shelter was covered in posters for rock bands. Marigold was in the middle of descri describing Daphne's summer and winter outfits, but she stopped short, distracted. What? I said. Emerald City are doing a reunion, gi reunion gig. Oh God, Emerald City. I went to two of their concerts back in the 80s. They were Mickey's favourite band. My tummy tightened. It was usually a danger sign if Marigold started talking about Mickey. But she stared at the poster, dazzled. She had the clover in her hand, twirling it round and round in her fingers. And that is where we will leave part two of The Illustrated Mum by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.